2020 was a pretty tumultuous year, to say the least. There was, of course, the coronavirus pandemic that froze the global economy for about a year. There was the uprising after the murder of George Floyd, one of the largest mass protests in American history. And then, of course, there was the rise of right-wing militia violence, which culminated with the storming of the Capitol on January 6th. Now, one of the most shocking examples of what is now being called domestic terrorism was when a group of militiamen were arrested in Michigan for allegedly trying to kidnap the governor, Gretchen Whitmer, after she implemented lockdowns in her state. But we're going to begin tonight with that alleged terror plot and the chilling plan. The FBI says it stopped before it could be carried out. A plan to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer and then what they were planning to do to her. Thirteen suspects arrested, including seven alleged members of a right-wing militia group. The FBI and state authorities conducting a series of raids in Michigan. Those 13 suspects taken into custody, seven of them alleged members of that right-wing militia group. Governor Whitmer has been the target of protests since last spring over restrictions aimed to stop the spread of COVID amid one of the early outbreaks. Michigan, of course, a hot spot at the time. Now, that came in October of 2020, just a few months after armed right-wing protesters entered the Michigan State Capitol and occupied it. Lawmakers in Michigan are taking extra precautions today after the Capitol building was overrun by protesters, some of whom were armed with semi-automatic weapons. Let us in! Let us in! Now, these two events, understandably, freak people out. But in the months since the arrests, information has come to light that casts serious doubt on the narrative that came out of the FBI and the media. The attorney for at least one of the defendants is alleging that the FBI actually entrapped these men, encouraging and helping them to hatch this conspiracy all along the way. Members of a group called the Wolverine Watchmen, they were spotted at anti-lockdown protests at Michigan's Capitol last year, now looking at felony charges of conspiracy to kidnap, but a motion recently filed by defendant Caleb Franks is raising questions around the case. It alleges that the government was working with 12 different confidential sources within the group. His attorney now requesting all information on those informants from the government to better prepare for trial. Now, of course, the defense attorney is going to try anything to get his client off, but a deeply reported investigation by BuzzFeed News that came out this week seems to corroborate the narrative. It writes, quote, an examination of the case by BuzzFeed News also reveals that some of these informants acting under the direction of the FBI played a far larger role than has previously been reported. Working in secret, they did more than just passively observe and report on the actions of the suspects. Instead, they had a hand in nearly every aspect of the alleged plot, starting with its inception. The extent of their involvement raises serious questions as to whether there would have been there would have even been a conspiracy without them. The recent filing also outlines potentially problematic relationships between confidential informants and the FBI, saying one has a, quote, decades long history of acting as a professional snitch for the government while pointing out that another received about $54,000 for his cooperation and a third received an envelope with $2,500 inside. Now, the fact that there were almost as many federal informants, 12, as men arrested in this whole affair, 13, certainly raises a few eyebrows, especially when you start to read about the, the informant's role within the whole plot. According to BuzzFeed's report, Quote, a longtime government informant from Wisconsin, for example, helped organize a series of meetings around the country where many of the alleged plotters first met one another and the earliest notions of the plan took root, some of those people say. The Wisconsin informant even paid for some hotel rooms and food as an incentive to get people to come. Then he writes, the, the Iraq war vet, another informant named Dan, for his part, became so deeply enmeshed in a Michigan mili militant group that he rose to become its second in command, encouraging members to collaborate with other potential suspects and paying for their transportation to meetings. He prodded the alleged mastermind of the kidnapping plot to advance his plan and then baited the trap that led to the arrest. Now, one of the key parts of the conspiracy was a plan to blow up a bridge in order to prevent law enforcement from reaching the men after they kidnapped the governor. Now, according to BuzzFeed, the man who'd advised them on where to put the explosives and offered to get them as much as the, ta as much as the task would require 
was an undercover FBI agent. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, come on, Mando, this is ridiculous. The FBI could never pull this kind of thing off. These were clearly very bad dudes, and they got what they deserved. Thing is, the FBI has a long history of this exact type of behavior. When this whole story broke back in October of 2020, Branko Marcidic at, at Jacobin published a piece urging people not to buy the media and the FBI's narrative. He wrote a headline that read, we shouldn't trust the FBI's narrative on the Gretchen Whitmer kidnapping scheme. And then he wrote a subhead that wrote, the details of the kidnapping plot targeting Michigan government, Governor Gretchen Whitmer are disturbing and show the real danger of the far right. But given the FBI's very recent history of using undercover informants as provocateurs to push people into planning terror plots that otherwise would not have would never have happened, we should examine its narrative closely. Bronco's main point in the piece is that this all seemed a little too perfect. And he went on to outline several examples of the FBI's, let's say, overzealous prosecution of domestic terrorists, which in the wake of 9-11 were mostly Muslim men who were encouraged to declare loyalty to groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS by the FBI and then arrested for it. One particularly shocking example was the case of Peyton Pruitt, who actually was not Muslim, but was arrested by the FBI for allegedly declaring fealty to ISIS online, despite the fact that he was intellectually disabled. Peyton Pruitt was arrested last November. He was charged with soliciting support for a terrorist act after staff at a school where Peyton lived noticed some suspect behavior. Peyton had bought a book about ISIS, watched a documentary about ISIS, and communicated with people who appeared to be affiliated with ISIS on social media. Tony Pruitt says all of these things are true. However... This whole thing, in, in, in my opinion, and as well as I know Peyton, was was like a video game. Uh, I've spoken to him several times about it, and he understands that he did wrong, but his intentions were not to ever hurt anyone. See, Peyton Pruitt is intellectually disabled. He has autism, and he's mentally retarded with ADD. This is a copy of one of Peyton's achievement assessments from earlier this year. It shows he has the cognitive ability of an eight-year-old even though he's 19. The pain for me was seeing and trying to understand what his mind is going through as an eight-year-old being handcuffed and put in the back of a police car. Now, the FBI questioned Peyton for hours, encouraging, to, encouraging him to forego his right to an attorney, even though he didn't understand what the concept of an attorney even was. Peyton Pruitt was eventually released, but only after spending nearly a year in prison. And another case that was particularly instructive and more similar to what happened in Michigan was the case of the so-called Liberty City 7, which happened in my hometown of Miami at the height of the Bush era. Well, they're known as the Liberty City 7 after a neighborhood in Miami. The feds say these terror suspects from the Miami area wanted to ignite a guerrilla street war in our country, basically, and bring down the government put in, Isl in an Islamic regime. The men reportedly told informants that bombings weren't enough. They wanted to create chaos. Prosecutors say they planned to blow up the Sears Tower in Chicago, the FBI office in Miami, among others, and to even get down to the level of poisoning salt shakers in restaurants. Not the salt shakers. Now, I remember this case at the time. People in Miami were absolutely freaked out. I mean, there was a total media frenzy at the time, and it was the, the big story for a while. Well, it turns out the whole thing was just a bunch of BS. Right. So you, I'm glad you brought up the, the case in Florida, which is the which was known as the Liberty City 7 case. And that's actually the case that, that first alerted me to, to what was happening. And it was really one of the first cases um, that the FBI used these sting tactics in a, in a terrorism case. Um, and in that case, you know, I happened to be a reporter down in Miami, and I was there when they announced the charges, which uh, were themselves on, on its face, you know, on their face very ridiculous, which was that the FBI accused seven men who lived in Liberty City, which is a, a poor African-American and Haitian-American area of Miami, of plotting a ground war against the United States government. You know, obviously seven guys can't effectively plot a ground war, yet through this plot, the FBI described how they met an al-Qaeda operative, and that al-Qaeda operative was going to help them bomb the Sears Tower and also the Miami office of the FBI. But on close inspection of that case, it was clear that it wasn't all that it seemed. They, they never had any weapons. All of the weapons would have been provided by the government. They never knew anyone from al-Qaeda. The al-Qaeda operative was actually a paid FBI informant. And they really never had any means or opportunity for committing their crime 
were it not for the the FBI providing everything that they needed. And um, and you know what also came out was that these men were were pretty much idiots. You know, one man, the leader, a man named Narciel Batiste, described how he had hoped to bomb the Sears Tower, and if it fell in such a way, it would. Uh, hit Lake Michigan and cause a tsunami that would drown the city of Chicago. Um, obviously, that's, that's patently ridiculous, but it's also indicative of, of many people who are caught in these sting operations. And, and so what my research tried to do was look at every terrorism prosecution that had come out of U.S. courts in the decade after 9-11 and try to figure out how many involved really dangerous people and how many involved people like the Liberty City 7 who were not for the FBI would never have been able to commit their crimes and and what I found, I think, was, was pretty striking, which was that, you know, in the decade after 9-11, there were a handful of cases involving truly dangerous people. Uh, Faisal Shahzad, for example, delivered a bomb to Times Square, or Najib Azazi tried to uh, detonate bombs on the New York City subway system. Then you have the underwear bomber and the shoe bomber. But except for about five defendants, the rest of the cases involved people who were caught in sting operations that were it not for the FBI, never would have been able to move forward in a terrorist plot. And in the decade after 9-11, 150 people were indicted and convicted who were like the Liberty City 7, who were it not for the FBI, never could have committed their crimes. And for the most part, these were people on the fringes of Muslim communities, mentally ill, economically desperate, and easily manipulated by FBI informants or undercover agents. 150 people in the decade after 9-11 most of them mentally ill, economically desperate, or easily manipulated by the FBI. But lest you think that this is a recent phenomenon, well, it's not. This is a common tactic going back to the very, to the very founding of the FBI. The most famous operation was known as COINTELPRO, in which the FBI infiltrated various left-wing groups with agent provocateurs, who then encouraged infighting as well as acts of violence in order to discredit them. One of the classic examples of this was the case of Afeni Shakur, mother of one Tupac Shakur. She was a Black Panther in the 1970s, and she was also arrested for allegedly plotting to commit acts of terrorism. One morning, armed police stormed into Afeni Shakur's apartment and arrested her. All the other members of her cell were also arrested. They were charged with what the government said was a giant plan to destroy those elements of society which the defendants call the power structure. It included attacking police stations and planning to bomb five large department stores and the Bronx Botanical Gardens. They became known as the Panther 21. Their trial was held in a state of paranoia about further attacks by the Panthers. But it also caused a sensation when it was revealed that three of the founding members of the group had been undercover police officers. What was stranger was that some of those officers seemed to have been unaware that there were other undercover agents in the cell. They were also the most active members of the group. We had to organize everything, one of the undercover agents explained at the trial, because everyone else in the group was off doing what they called their own shit. They're off doing their own shit. Now, Afeni Shakur ended up representing herself in court, forgoing the right to an attorney, and actually won her case by getting the undercover a agents to admit that they were the ones orchestrating everything. And when you look at the details of the Michigan plot to kidnap Governor Whitner, uh, a lot of the same patterns start to emerge. The alleged mastermind of the plot was a guy named Adam Fox, who at the time of the storming of the state capitol, just six months before the plot to kidnap the governor was to be executed, he had no ties to any militant groups whatsoever. Fox was living with his dogs in the basement of a friend's vacuum repair shop, the Vac Shack, in Grand Rapids. Lacking long-term employment, he smoked weed and spent hours on Facebook looking to make connections with other members of the Patriot community who felt angry at a government they felt had failed them, according to his fiance at the time, Amanda Keller. Fox's main outlet was pumping iron. Keller, who was with him on April 30th, said she had thought of Fox as a teddy bear, but his mood changed overnight when Whitmer, as part of her stay-at-home order, closed all the gyms in the state. Now, after the riot at the Michigan State Capitol, Fox got more involved in the Wolverine Watchmen group, often with the outright encouragement of the federal informant named Dan, the former Iraq war veteran. Quote, stopping violent, idea, uh, violent ideas like this was what Dan said drove him to law enforcement in the first place. But now with his two FBI agents at his side, he told Fox he would help. Hey, man, Dan said, if you want to come and train at Joe's sometime with us, that would be great. 
Dude, we are down to fucking train, brother. For sure, Fox replied. But as the weeks went on, Fox's behavior got stranger and stranger to the point where he started to freak out other members of the group. Quote, listening to him that night, Beller, one of the watchmen, became convinced that Fox was out of his mind and repeatedly shared those concerns with Dan, court testimony shows. Morrison, the group's commanding officer, also expressed reservations about Fox. But Dan used his growing influence to include Fox in group meetings and to develop his own personal relationship with him. Fox, in turn, began referring to Dan as his brother, according to Fox's former fiance. So this guy, Dan, a federal informant, was doing his best to keep the increasingly unhinged Fox in the group's good graces. And then, a few weeks later, Dan drove five watchmen and 6,000 rounds of ammunition to Cambria, Wisconsin, for a national training exercise. He rented a Suburban for the weekend, paid for gas, and subsidized food and lodging for the group, all courtesy of the FBI. So you start to see the dynamic here. There's definitely a seed of bad behavior amongst groups like these. But often, it's the FBI itself that pours water on that seed and provides the necessary nutrients for that seed to grow. Without the FBI's help, maybe these guys would have just been annoying assholes who cosplay with guns and post memes on Facebook all day. But back to the original storming of the Michigan State Capitol, which was a sort of preview of the storming of the national capitol in D.C. on January 6th. Our good friend Dan was in the thick of that as well. In fact, he did his best to try to warn the FBI that this was going down. Quote, panic rising, Dan slipped away from the group for a moment and spoke into the recording device he was carrying, which he knew was being monitored live by his FBI handlers. The watchmen, he said, were preparing to breach the Capitol. The agents couldn't speak back to him, but he hoped they could at least warn the police about what was coming. But then something, something surprising happened. The Michigan State Police stood down and let the protesters, including those in full tactical gear, enter the building unopposed. They could even bring their guns so long as they submitted to a temperature check for COVID-19. Now, that seems strange, doesn't it? At the time, it was seen as evidence that the state police forces were just sympathetic to the right-wing militia cause and let them walk right in. But as Branko Marcidic points out in a piece this, this week for Jacobin, this kind of thing, just like the Fed's behavior before the January 6th riot, are the perfect pretext to expand the state security forces' power. He writes, Speaking of January 6th, there remains serious questions about law enforcement agencies' conduct on that day. The security and intelligence failure, which was the only reason the Stop the Steal protest was able to get out of hand and charge into the Capitol, still hasn't been adequately explained. Besides contradictory testimony from officials about the failure of their response, we know the FBI and others warned the Capitol Police in advance about the protests. We now also know that there was at least one undercover agent among the rioters, on top of the fact that the leader of the Proud Boys, one of the far-right groups who took part in the incident, was a prolific law enforcement informant. In the words of his own lawyer, and at least four Proud Boy leaders in total were feeding information to the Bureau since 2019, directly contradicting the FBI, FBI director's sworn testimony earlier this year. Why, given all this, did law enforcement fail so spectacularly to keep a mostly unarmed crowd of protesters out of the Capitol, particularly after the police's militarized and heavy-handed response to the anti-police brutality protests over the past six years? How were they taken by surprise when the entire event was planned in the open anyway? Why have law enforcement officials offered inconsistent, contradictory, and even misleading testimony? All good questions the national press has been largely uninterested in, obsessed instead with debunking overcooked claims that the FBI organized the riot. None of this points to a deliberate conspiracy, but it certainly seems like the two principal events upon which a dangerous new domestic war on terror has been launched off of are, first, a kidnapping plot that only existed because the FBI made it happen, and second, a completely avoidable security failure by law enforcement that was asleep at the wheel. In other words, it points to a classic national security dynamic, agencies overzealously prosecuting national security threats or royally screwing up, and instead of admitting to the mistakes, using the incidents to justify more power and resources for themselves. And what are the concrete, concrete effects of this? Well, a more powerful and unaccountable security state. Just like the spate of laws that were passed after 9-11 that allowed the government to essentially spy on everyone, in the wake of January 6th, left-wing lawmakers facilitated the passage of a bill funneling enormous amounts of money and resources to the Capitol Police, which has now alarmingly, alarmingly been expanded into a national anti-terrorism police force, one that's conveniently exempt from the Freedom of Information Act. Now, this was always going to be the end game. 
In the 60s and 70s, the government played on people, preyed on people's fears of left-wing revolutionary groups in the aughts. It was all about jihadist terrorism. Now, in the wake of Trump, the boogeyman is these right-wing militias, which isn't to say that they are great guys by any stretch of the imagination. But one just has to do a simple power analysis to evaluate the gravity of their threat. As often comes out months after people have moved on from the story, it was the FBI itself who played up the threat. And it's not like these FBI agents are great guys either. In fact, the lead special agent in the case of the kidnapping plot, a guy named Richard Trask, is now facing criminal charges of his own, accused of smashing his wife's head against the nightstand and choking her at her home in Kalamazoo County's Ashtempo Township on July 18th, according to a criminal complaint filed this week. On the day of the attack, Trask and his wife drank alcohol while attending a swingers party at a hotel, and Trask's, uh, and she didn't like the event and couple fought on the way home, according to an affidavit in support of the charges against Trask. In their bedroom at home, the wife was laying down when Trask got on top of her and grabbed the sides of her head, the affidavit said. Trask, Trask smashed her head into a nearby nightstand multiple times. Then Trask's wife then tried to grab Trask's beard to get him off of her, but he started to choke her. The affidavit said the woman told police she doesn't think she lost consciousness before she grabbed Trask's testicles, ending the fight. So the bottom line is, don't trust the FBI's narrative when it says it has foiled a dangerous terrorist plot. The incentives on a micro level are for personal career advancement. That's, that's obvious. And on the macro level, they are more power to the FBI. The FBI has orchestrated domestic terror plots for decades in order to play up its own vital role. The media often runs with the story immediately rather than waiting to evaluate evidence and questioning the narrative. Next time, we should be more cautious and we should watch for the predictable effects of playing up fears of terrorism, whether foreign or domestic. It never ends well. What I hate is that this just provides um, more fodder for conspiracy theorists and stuff, right? Like, and, and people who don't trust our institutions because they have good reason to not trust institutions. And so it's so counterproductive. It's awful. I mean, yes, there are the ramifications that you perfectly outlined regarding, you know, the security state, more surveillance, more interference in our day to day lives that violate our privacy rights and all of that, our civil liberties. But then there's also a huge I mean, it's all interconnected. Right. When you look at the more insane conspiracy theorists uh, or theories that are out there or like QAnon's a good example, I think. Right. It's so hard to counter that with evidence because they don't trust the institutions that are trying to provide evidence counter to what they believe. So it's just, it keeps getting worse. And I don't know what the solution is really, um, because are we going to stop the FBI from doing what the FBI does? I mean, if the FBI wanted to keep an eye on things because there's a group of people who might be on their own planning some sort of terrorist threat in the US, that makes sense. But planning a seed or literally like planning the plot themselves and then shifting that blame onto any group of people is not what the FBI is supposed to be doing. That doesn't keep anyone safe. What it does is it makes it appear as though they're doing their jobs and they're effective at it. I think that's part of what motivates them. But also, yes, I think it, it provides um, the excuse to violate civil liberties and encroach on our on our freedoms. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 not dissimilar to um, when you see kind of news happening um, around the world that kind of benefits uh, the national security state that comes from sources in the national security state that are like, you know, for the, a good example is one that we always talk about. It's kind of like our hobby horse, which is the the Russian bounty uh, in Afghanistan story, mm -hmm. which came out and everyone's like, oh, my God, can you believe this? Can you believe this? And like, obviously, all the sourcing was just like, you know, high level uh, people in the Pentagon <laughs> and stuff like that. And it's like, this is so obviously um, a, a, a like a plant into the media in order to justify, you know, our staying in Afghanistan to justify, you know, whatever, like whatever belligerence towards Russia and like a million things that kind of benefit um, the national security state. Um, and then the media is just like, whoa, wow, look, this, this is this is happening. We 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 just run with it and then people like read it and then they believe it. You know, like that's just that's what that's what drives me crazy about all of this stuff is that like we should never trust government sources like they're they're self-interested just like anyone else. 
but the media is very very obsequious towards government sources they they especially like yep. especially like the cable news and and all these they, it's like if the government is saying it they believe it wholesale and you just can't but, believe it you just can't believe it well yeah and i like i going back to the point about everything being connected um why why does the media just believe what government sources have to say rather than being incredibly skeptical of, of of their sources well it goes back to the profit motive behind media which is why the fairness doctrine was so incredibly important right they want access to these sources uh because access to these sources definitely plays a role in um the reporting they're able they're able to say oh we got a scoop we got the scoop right and yeah that allows them to um, increase the readership or the viewership of their content and make mm -hmm. a profit. Like it, it always yeah. goes back to the profit motive. So, and, and yeah, they don't want to, they don't want to destroy their contacts or, or their relationship with these sources. And so they'll yeah. do this like incredibly weak, flimsy reporting that carries out manufactured narratives that manufacture the consent for wars that we shouldn't be engaged in. Yeah, no, and, and in the case of 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 this this latest stuff coming out of the uh, from the FBI and and all these right wing groups, you know, again, it's it it's it's not dissimilar to like um, radical uh, Islamic terrorism or whatever. Like there is like a seat, there is like a seed of of truth there like it's not like completely just a, a total fiction you know like there are right-wing uh very dangerous uh militia groups out there and they're not people that i want to be around or you know <laughs> and uh yep. but you, you know like you have to try as best you can um to have a little perspective uh, on it because when it becomes this kind of big media frenzy um then the response is always like, well, we got to do something about it. And the 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 tools available to do something about it um, are always the same. They're just an expansion of of the security state's power. It's just that that like the I remember like talking to Bessner about it, like the 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 day after the January sixth uh, thing happened, and he was like, you know, this is what's going to happen. You know, like it is like this is what this is what happened. <laughs> you know, like because we have so, so much historical precedent. Um, to, to lean on. It's just the same thing over and over again. It's much like when you hear about like some media story about some attack on American soldiers and abroad, like, you know, whether it was the Gulf of Tonkin or whether it was like a million other things where, you know, it's just used as a casus belli to go to war. Um, and you got to question those things because over time, what always ends up coming out is that these things were exaggerated or they didn't happen or they were orchestrated by the by the military itself. I mean, that's just that's that's the 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 reality of this. And with the case of of January 6th, which like it, it happened, it, it was it was so obvious that something was gonna happen. I mean, they were like talking about it openly on 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 Facebook and on social media in, in the weeks leading up to it, and yet they did nothing about it. They did, you know, it just it was just allowed to happen. And you know, again, you look at the, it's like that, that scene in Lebowski, you know, you know, it's like Lenin said, you know, you ask who benefits, uh, qui bono or whatever. And uh, all of a sudden the Capitol police <laughs> is getting <laughs> increased funding and, you know, vast sweeping powers to do this like national anti-terrorism police force. And by the way, exempt from the Freedom of Information Act. Great. Ken Klippenstein can't even mm -hmm. like uh, look into their shit. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think the January 6th situation is, it's frustrating because they had a very, they ha, they're they obviously not organized and don't really have a real strategy or plan in place, but their motives were clear and what they were attempting to do was clear. And had they gotten to the same room that lawmakers were in, who knows what would have happened, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's that, but at the same time, you know, yes, uh, deal with people who have broken the law, sure. But more importantly, on the day that that happened, right before the riots, you have Congressman Mo Brooks, you know, giving um, a speech, incite, like partially inciting what happened. And, you know, he was interviewed by the slate and he stupidly admitted that he was wearing a bulletproof vest. He was wearing body armor. Why were you wearing body armor unless you were expecting violence to break out? And if you were expecting violence to break out, why did you give the kind of speech that you did? You get what I'm mm -hmm. so like I bring that up because 
I want people in positions of power to be held accountable for what they did, for their mm -hmm. their encouragement of what happened in the Capitol that day. And right now, you know, we keep hearing about this uh, select committee to investigate what happened. They're so hyper focused on the perpetrators, like the people who who stormed the Capitol. But there's very little conversation about the lawmakers who who lied to the American people for weeks leading up to that, right? Lying to the American people about what actually happened or transpired in the 2020 election. Those are, and then some of those people are involved in the investigation. How insane is that? Like the whole thing is insane. And so for anyone yeah. who wants like justice and, or more importantly, like justice is one thing. I just don't want it to happen again. I just don't want it to happen again, right? Yeah. But if, if you want to prevent that from happening again, the, you need to get to the heart of the issue. And I don't see anyone in Congress focused on that at all. No, no, they're not. And 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 like you said, I mean, like, you know, the QAnon shaman is a like a patsy. Like he's just such an obvious dumbass, you know, um, and 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 all these people, are, like a bunch of people are going to go to jail and whatever. They're they're you know, I don't they're, they're awful people, whatever. Um, but the but the 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 actual root causes are not going to be addressed, and then the effects, the long term effects, are going to be incredibly negative. I mean, it's the same. It's it's right. it's a, a version of what happened after nine eleven. You know, like obviously the, what happened after nine eleven was much was much graver, but it's a it's a version of the same exact dynamic, in which like we were just focused on the wrong thing. We were just absolutely focused on the wrong thing. We were not focused on the root causes. And then our, our response to it was insanely overblown and not addressing any of the root causes. Instead, focusing the um, the brunt of it on innocent people, on, you know, and and and, and expanding the, the, the state's power to do all kinds of previously illegal stuff, while also doing a lot of currently illegal stuff, but then not prosecuting the state, the state on, on any of that stuff, whether it was torture or, you know, illegal rendition or things like that. Um, and so versions of like that are going to happen because these people are so obviously unsavory. I mean, if you watch the video of these like right wing militia guys, like they're insane. They're insane. And they're, yeah. they're awful. I, I hate that, you know, like loot they're they're but they're such an easy, they're such an easy thing to, to, to serve up, you know, and we're, we're mm -hmm. like, it's so tempting for us to lap it up to be like, oh yeah, yeah. Just keep throw the, you know, like, get those guys, you know, like do it, like do whatever it takes, you know, like get those guys out of here. But like, we have to try to yeah. uh, um, exhibit a little bit of self-control and caution and be like, what's really going on here? Who benefits? You know, what are the root causes and what are the effect? What are the likely predictable effects? Yeah. I mean, I wish that there was a way to focus on actual con when I, when I talk about holding people accountable in regard to January 6th, I'm talking about the politicians who, who did this, right. Who, who like just nonstop provocative speeches, nonstop lies, uh, you know, encouraging them to do what they did. There's no conversation about consequences for them. In fact, the only time they're part of the con conversation is, well, are they going to be, are they going to be good team players in investigating the Capitol riots? Why do you want the people who provoked the Capitol riots to be part of the investigation in the Capitol riots? Like it just makes no sense. And, and that's yeah. honestly, part of the problem with the Democratic Party, right? Like Nancy Pelosi putting like Liz Cheney on, on the select committee. She was one of the um, people that Pelosi appointed and like bragging about how this is gonna be a bipartisan effort, everyone. We wouldn't want this to appear political. No, but the whole point of the select committee in the way that it's being carried out is only political. It's not really about getting to the bottom of everything. And, that, and that's, frustrating for someone who actually wants uh, the very people in positions of power to be held accountable for what they did.